Hello, everyone. Um, I just wanted to begin on this first full day of a new administration um, to also wish a very happy birthday to our very own Jennifer Litt. Happy birthday. Thank you for everything you have done. Um, and I also just want to say that uh, as a, a four-way author, um, it is just such an honor to be able to introduce two of my pressmates uh, along with our unstoppable publisher, Martha Rhodes. And to begin with Laurent Bosselard, I could tell you in standard introductory fashion that Laurent developed her delicious accent in Belgium, or that she edited numerous anthologies and translations with her late husband, the poet Kurt Brown, and is the author of four collections, including the heart-rending These Many Rooms, published by Four Way Books in 2019, or even that she is the current Poet Laureate of Santa Barbara. I could tell you that during a previous incarnation as a talk show host, she was known in some circles as the Belgian Oprah, which should make us feel especially fortunate to have her as this festival's interviewer in chief where we've witnessed her coax Sharon Olds into talking about that one time she crawled beneath Emily Dickinson's bed, or just a couple of days ago, Gregory Orr into sharing two brand new villanelles. But here's the thing I really want to say about Laurent, that she greets the world with open arms, and so too does she open the aperture of her poetry wide enough to take in everything from the trauma of cruelties others fear to name, to the grief of losing her beloved Kurt, to how when light reflects from water into an empty room, it's as if lit syllables quivered on the bricks. As she wrote in her recent poem, Parentage, which won the James Dickey Prize for Poetry. I'm from the ocean's melancholy dragging its anchors back and forth, never quiet, never still, waves so restless they can't mirror the moon. From the gold and silver of a man's ring on my finger, from him too, and from each book I ever held, my shelved provenance, language, womb, and sail. Laurent's poems encourage a far-reaching awareness, as well as the imperative to take real risks, and even in times as difficult as this last lonely year, to seek out love and joy and lift them in praise. Please join me in welcoming Laurent Bosselard. Yeah, thank you, my dear, dear Jessica. And with open arms, I wish I could hug you and then close my arms, but alas, thank you for that introduction. I'm very happy to read with Martha tonight, who is my publisher and then my team, my uh, press mate. And I do want to uh, thank Susan um, for, this first experience of, of zooming everything and, and happy birthday to you, Jennifer and Marcy, thank you. And my intern, Eileen, they are oh, um, a savior and, and, and I love you dearly and get ready next year, Eileen, when we'll all be in the flesh and in Florida that I will hug you a million times. Again, Jessica, all my heart, thank you. I'm going to dedicate this reading to Miles and to Mimi and to my workshop tribe who are just giving their all. So that's for you tonight. First day of the new year. It is early. A bird flies deep into the sky, into that large silence. The sun so new, it weaves hair-thin rays through the shadows and weaves. 
then the passing of a distant train. I'm all willing attention, as I was yesterday standing at the ocean's rack line, watching waves swallow the year's last light, watching the waves swallow it again, then shatter it into a firework of droplets before they crashed, dying on the sand and rocks. But this hush of a morning in my garden is all mystery still. The ferns and tree, my only company. And I ask nothing of them but to give me the time to breathe in this hour and the time for it to take me where it will. There's a, a lovely phenomenon in, um, on the on the southern coast, well, no, on the whole Pacific coast, called the marine layer, and it's a kind of very low fog that slips in during the night like a lover, and um, it covers everything, and then the burn the sun burns it up to the marine layer. Look. I might not have woken up early enough to watch you hang your rags over the hedge or witnessed you loiter in the yard's waning night. But I'm here now, so linger by my window a little and stay. Blur nature's bright drop cloth a while longer. Fade the jay's coat and the fern's deep jade and wait for me. I'll come walk inside you, wrapped in my gray scarf, drizzled, breathing in your ocean whiffs, eyes closed, smiling at nothing. No, at everything, while the dog chases her first squirrel of the day. Stay. Soak the yard with dew before the sun blisters it away and light blasts us all with what will be the colors of the day. A tear's trace on a caged child's face. The drained reds of violence. The wild fabrics of a million masks. And the dandelion's defiant gold blazing out of a concrete crack. Mm. There's something funny about the title of this next poem because I kept it. it the, the poem is, the title is Complaint About Missing Friends After, and then I wrote four months of the pandemic and then five months of the pandemic and then eight months of the pandemic. And so now I took the number out. Complaint about missing friends after months of the pandemic. No one near to see or hear me, but the dog who signs when I say, who sighs when I say serious things, and I am dead serious when I tell her how her gray muzzle is softer than Samarkand silk. No one to tell, I just read that on hot summer nights, Verlaine threw pail after pail after cold water pail on the gravel on Rimbaud's windows to cool the air as he slept. No one to sidestep with me to some silly tune as the dog's tail wags out of rhythm. No one to listen to my Flemish song about spring coming soon and the phallus impudicus being almost in bloom. To see me kneel by the rosemary, breathing in its oily green before night will come flitting into the yard and the skunks and raccoons will join in to feast on such fresh darkness. No friends to be here with all this and wave fondly as they leave the rosemary, the dog, 
the evening and me, but leaving behind a lilt in their voice. Good night, good night. This poem is about Kurt Brown. Seven years now, and a few of his friends call still on his birthday. Oh, we loved him. He was a kind man. We miss him. Loved and was are gone with him in the past tense, yet miss is still so very much in the present. His good friends, their simple conjugations bring him back to me there inside their longing. But I don't tell them that one fears sentimentality. Nor do I tell them how I wondered at his intricate syntax when he spoke to the cat. Or how often I'd stop being busy just to listen to him being noisily alive. I had planned to tell him that. Um, I'm from Belgium and one of my two um, mother tongues is French, the other one is Flemish. Um, and in my mother tongue, death, um, everything has a gender, like death is feminine, a table is feminine, a mirror is masculine, right? And I need you to know that before I read this. Late afternoon stroll on the cliffs. As usual, death sweetly slips her arm in mine and we both take a deep breath from the eucalyptus breeze. We both worked honestly at our job all day. Death destroyed traffic with wailing ambulances while I killed hours and lines on eight and a half by 11 pages. We're fast friends by now, death much older, of course, but there's no hierarchy between us. We're both taking a break from it all, glad to watch waves collapse on rocks and pelicans dive bomb fish. I try to be sensitive to death's guilt, that whole pandemic disaster that she can no longer control. She'll soon betray me too, like she will you. I know that. But today, the gulls are like silver angels etching great cursive blessings in a perfect sky. So death and I make believe we believe that and amble on. Parented. Mine is not from the morass of Flanders marshes, although their hues ink my eyes. Not from a mother, her head spun always away. Nor from convent walls or kisses that I hid, head bowed inside my childhood palms to quiet longing, such longing. But from a Flemish farmer once who held my face in both hands to kiss my brow for no longer than a second, that brief, but with such will and tenderness that I can now lift my head far back to read the clouds. I'm from the ocean's melancholy dragging its anchors back and forth, never quiet, never still, waves so restless they can't mirror the moon. I am from those waters, from those ebbings, from the two wedding bands on my finger, from them too, and from every book I ever held, 
my shelved provenance, language womb, and sail. It rains about four and a half times a year here. So when there's a night of rain, it's, it's a big event. After a night of rain, blank, the sky hangs there, drained. On the window panes, drops still cling, the ones that will leave their mark. A brief message from night rain's passage. Look at me, my nose almost to the glass, one finger following a drop's trace, making up what it might say. How I want to read, stay with me, stay. And how everything now seems to say it too. Even the toe he's sharp here, here. So I stop my busy nothingnesses, and sit a while at my good table by the white bowl, edged golden by the sun. That welcome sun, glad to push the last mist shreds into the hills and come linger along my bookshelves, as if trying to find the book and in it the page that reads, this is the world, it is yours all signs, omens, and ruins. I will leave this window soon, this room, my books. The tohi will leave for other gardens while white and no new clouds will gather over the Pacific and billow, beautiful, inside a newborn breeze. I, in, in 1960, I met my first love, my first beautiful, you know, when you're, when you're 18, forever love, right? And we had promised one another to stay in touch. Maybe we wouldn't live forever with one another, the big love that we felt for each other, but let's stay in touch until we die. And guess what? We did. And we're both still alive. And um, this is a poem about that. In response to a yearly letter from my first love with whom I made a pact to keep in touch. You ask me how I am. All your letters start with that same question. And I always reply, I'm well, I'm fine. I'm glad your heart is holding up, so is mine, well, mostly. When I imagine what you look like, you're still lanky, hollow-cheeked with dense, messy curls, but white now. I'm all gray streaks, wrinkles, and solitude. I always felt sad seeing an old man or woman rocking on their porch alone. But just yesterday, I thought of buying one of those chairs to sit under the tree and listen to the long sighs of distant trains. Pierre, when one has finally learned how to live, it's already too late. I'm no longer the understudy of shadows or listen to nothing but to Duende's guitars. Now the silence around a leaf letting go, rains patter on the old path to my door, a vole's zigzags in the grass, and my days are stunned with abundance. Antwerp, summer of 1960. How beautiful are bodies in that attic room. And if you don't mind, I will read the last two lines of that, but in Flemish, because the letter I wrote to him 
the whole poem is in, in Flemish. Nu de stilte rond een blad dat loslaat, het geklets van de regen op de oude pad naar mijn door, of de zigzag van een woelmuis in het gras, dat is genoeg. Mijn dagen zijn dan verbluft door overvloed. Antwerpen, zomer van 1960. Hoe mooi onze lichamen in dat zolderkamer. And I'm going to read my last poem and I thank you for being there and I'm looking forward to listen to the other readers and thank you again, Jessica. By the way, these were all new poems um, that will be in my next book that Martha Rhodes will publish in, in three or four years. Ode, oh, let me tell you that schorren are, um, are, what are they called in English? Large tidal salt marshes bordering the estuary of the River Scheldt in Antwerp. And uh, those salt marshes are humongous and, and, and the, the, the tides come in and then pull back and then come in and then pull back. Ode to the Schorren. Ode to the Schorren and their skin thin silt, the shelt ground down from rocks, slopes and swamps. That rainy day gray mud, a satin muck that slips through fingers and escapes toward the insatiable North Sea. Neptune was born there, a farmer told me, in that estuary where the sky is so low you can sip it from your lips. No horizon. Not a farm or field or path, only unbound marshes moored under the constant giggle of cloud ghosting gulls. It's this sludge, marsh soaked, that the winds whistle to and wrinkle braiding pickleweed and widgeon grass, and where cat-sized muskrats pull bitterns down into the sludge by the feet. Everything there is sopped with everything. Light with silt, silt with clouds, clouds with rain, and sloths with rot and slime. But in the spring, when grisiest clouds swell high in the air and sun shafts dive sudden and brilliant deep into the gully's throats, if you wait long enough right there out of the vaguely swaying sedge, you will hear it, the soar of the marsh warbler's song. And it's then that you'll press both hands to your heart, both hands to your heart. Thank you, everybody. Thank you very much. Oh, both hands to my heart. Thank you, Laron. That was, that was beautiful. Um, so if most collections of poetry are like entering a new world where the poet is the small g god of the place. Then a Kevin Proofer collection is more like a galaxy with each poem so vast and particular as its own planet, each with a distinct gravity and atmosphere. And within this galaxy, among Kevin's many powers is omniscience though we at times find a singular intimate eye. More often, this is a speaker God singing in the voices of his created multitudes. 
moving his gaze from a wide angle, sky-eyed point of view to close up so tight we can hear the tiny scritch scritching of an animal in the wall. So when I tell you Kevin Prufer's poems are a trip, this is part of what I mean. For in them also, you will find meticulously con constructed scenes that for another poet would be more than enough, would be the poem entire. But by Kevin are pushed even further, serving as embodied metaphors for a speaker's internal concerns. Like in The House Sitter, where he writes of a woman drowned in a hot tub. She is a useful metaphor for me. When I think of people I have loved, who, are now, who now are gone. Memories of the dead fill us as a body fills a tub. In the process, they displace other thoughts and memories. Editor at large of Pleiades, co-curator of the always compelling Unsung Master Series, and professor at both University of Houston and the Low Res MFA at Lesley University, he is soon to follow his collection, How He Loved Them, which was long listed for the Pulitzer Prize with The Art of Fiction, his eighth book and fifth with Four Way this March. So now, please secure your spacesuit, get ready to journey, and join me in welcoming Kevin Prufer. Thank you. That was such a nice introduction. And, um... And it's a real pleasure to read after Laurent, whose poems I love, and to read before Martha Rhodes, whose poems I love. Um, and a real pleasure to be here. I have such just terrific students um, here this year. So um, that's been an extraordinary pleasure. Um, I'm just going to read a few poems um, from my last three books with Four Way. Um, but just a few poems. And uh, the first one is from Churches. Um, and the poem is called Churches. In 1981, in a hotel gift shop outside Phoenix, Arizona, a little girl stood by the postcard rack, turning it gently. It creaked. She considered a picture of the desert, then looked around for her mother, who was elsewhere. She gave the rack a firm push so it spun gently on its axle, smiled, pushed it again, and the postcard rack wobbled on spindly legs. And soon she had it spinning so quickly the cards made long, blurry streaks in their rotation, gasps of blue for sky, red for dirt, and then faster, the girl slapping at it with her hand, grinning at me. And then a single postcard rose from the rack, spun in the air, and landed at my feet, a picture of a yawning canyon. And then another, handfuls of postcards rising from the rack, turning in the air, while the girl laughed at her oblivious mother at the other end of the store, bought a map or a box of fudge. And then the air was full of pictures, all of them shouting, Phoenix, 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 twirling and falling until the empty postcard rack groaned once more, tipped and crashed through the window. There ought to be a word that suggests how we're balanced at the very tip of history and behind us, everything speeds irretrievably away. It's called impermanence, the little girl said, looking at the mess of postcards on the floor. It's called transience, she said, gently touching the broken window. It's called dying, she said. It was 1981, and the clerk ran from behind the counter, stood before us. The girl smiled sweetly. The postcard rack glittered in the sun and broken glass. He turned to me, and my face grew hot. I couldn't help it. I was blushing. In 2009, my father lay in a hospital bed, gesturing sweepingly with his hands. What are you doing? I asked him. I'm building a church, he said. You're making a church, I said. Can't you see, he said. He seemed to be patting something in the air, sculpting something, a roof that floated above him. 
The hospital room was quiet and white. What kind of a church is it? I'm not finished. Is it a church you remember? God damn it, he said. Can't you see I'm busy? It was 1988 and I stood in line for my diploma and my father took a picture that I've lost now. 1984 and there we are around a campfire I can't remember. It was 2002 and his cells began to divide wrongly, first one deep in the wrist bone, then another turned hot and strange, deformed, humpbacked and fissured, queer and off kilter, one after the other, though no one would know it for years. It's called dying, the girl said, while the postcards suspended in the air like a thousand days. I reached out to touch one, then another, and all at once they fell to the floor. Then the clerk said, I was paying for the window. Where were my parents and who was going to pay if I didn't know where my parents were? And the girl smiled from behind the keychains, and her mother pursed her lips at the far end of the store. And the window had a hole in it through which the dry breeze came, and the postcards shifted on the floor. Years later, my father was still making that church with his hands. They do that, the nurse said, patting his head like he was a little boy. He was concentrating on his church though, his hands shaping first what seemed to be the apse and then fluttering gently down the transepts. He sighed heavily, frustrated, began again. Can I bring you anything else, the nurse asked. No, I said, thanks. Are you sure? She watched him tile the roof, watched his finger shape another arch, and then it was much later and he'd fallen asleep and outside snow covered up the cars. It's called forgetting, the girl said. Well, the clerk watched me and I blushed until there's nothing left. And a breeze entered through the hole in the window. And then you're out of time, she said and shrugged. Some of the cards were face up on the floor, two burrows climbing a craggy slope, the Grand Canyon like a mouth carved in the earth, a night lit tower like a needle. I was sweating now, but I couldn't speak. And then I was running from the shot. The book about churches. Kevin, there's transmission problem. I'm back. Am I back though? Yes, you were. Thank you. Where my father lay on a plastic beach chair Where my father lay on a plastic beach chair reading a book about churches Sunlight flecked his chest. His hair was wet from swimming. What's the trouble, he asked. First, his cells were thick and soupy, clotted and aghast, and then they were spinning through the air, and it was 1986, and rain drummed on the roof, for it was snowing years later in Am I back? Um, I'll keep talking. I can hear you, but I see Jessica. I, am I, am I, yeah, is this my computer or your computer? Looks like it's computer. yours. I seem to have a good Wi Fi signal, but nobody's moving. Can you go on a hotspot? Maybe. 
Um, yeah. I just connected to a different wireless. Is that working? Your voice is good. I don't see you. But but it's good now if we do? can hear at least hear you. Okay. I didn't get through that poem, but maybe I'll just give up on it. Uh, wh where did it end? Um, I don't. Your father. Uh, the, uh, okay. The image of your father in the lounge chair. Okay, we're right at the end. I'll just pick it up from there. I'm sorry about that. I don't know what's going on. The visual's um, not great. Maybe you should father... turn off. I'm just going to stop video. How's... Yes. Oh, but now the sound is off too. You know, why don't you go, why don't Martha Rhodes, why don't you read and I'll go try to I'll reboot my Wi-Fi. Is that okay? Would it be okay for Martha Rhodes to read and I'll just, I'll restart my Wi-Fi here? Thank you everyone for your patience. Um, technology is hard. <laughs> So um, hopefully we'll have Kevin back. Uh, he's rebooting right now, um, which means just a little bit earlier than planned, um, we have the pleasure of Martha Rhodes' company and poetry. Um, though I uh, was nowhere near as precocious as Martha Rhodes, who declared herself a poet at the tender age of 12. As a curious bookworm of a kid, one of the things I loved best about reading was how it was the closest I could get to experiencing firsthand how another person thinks and feels. Over five distinct collections, Martha's work has increasingly become a distillation of this experience, stripping away the guide rails of titles and overt narratives to enable a complete immersion in her speaker's memories, body, and sensibility. In poems that are fearless and searching and often cut by a sharp humor, from the first page of The Thin Wall, her most recent collection published by Pittsburgh University Press, you enter a vivid phantasmagoria where, like in any dream, with its loosely bound sequence of events, you are powerless to resist. So give yourself over to its magnificent cascade of images and ideas. We are many here, sand coated and ruddy, skin cracked and cold. We have lost our sense of where. We think in inches away from, who are you? And then with the final poem, you wake grateful for just a little while to have been carried, to have lived a life other than your own. Martha is also a consummate literary citizen, a founder and now the director of Four Way Books, where over 28 years she has nurtured authors at diverse stages of their careers with what Victoria Riddell, one of those authors, praises as her tough ass enthusiasm. As though this were not enough, as Martha teaches around the country at programs including Sarah Lawrence, the MFA program at Warren Wilson, and the Coleraine Manuscript Conference, it is impossible to gauge how many people's lives and work she has changed for the better. So please join me in welcoming 
the incomparable Martha Rhodes. Thank you so much, Jessica, and um, all of you for being here. Miles, Mimi, we go back a long time. Susan, Jen, uh, Abby, and Marcy, and my wonderful intern, Claire. Uh, all the books you want, just go to the website. It's yours. Um, <laughs> and um, my workshop, what a great group. Um, I'm going to actually read from uh, new work primarily. Uh, I'll probably end with something from the thin wall. And um, this is a manuscript I'm deep into. Um, uh, but, you know, just figuring it out. And uh, I'm going to give it a working title uh, for now. Uh, so I'll be reading from The Banished Ones. Neighborly. We invited them over from their fields to ours to join us naked and playful, to give them hope, to watch us joyfully trample our own lands and witness the greening anew overnight, our fields paid for, no mortgages to join us in and outside our tents of celebration and share our jungles and waterfalls. But when we woke, nothing, even the tents while we slumbered, gone. Our dogs, our shoes. To reclaim. Our just appointed soldiers Follow the Charles from Millis to Needham in search. We follow them as scouts, our dogs strewn on the wayside, shot and gutted, a scarf some recognize as their own, no other clues. I wish to go away from life today, join the dogs rotting, everything hurtling sideways, away from and at me. One of us ahead yells, look, and I peer into a ditch, my nudist leavings of stars still fuming, skittering, and I know I can begin again, but will I? Out of sorts, Rondeau. What's in the air? What's stalking me? that wasn't there until at three, just as the wind picked up that barn and settled it onto another's farm. Or did I dream this malevolency? Admittedly, I'm out of sorts. And all this week, I've wanted to lash out at those who speak as if there's nothing. Don't be alarmed. It's a gentle day. You won't be harmed. It's in your mind. You've never been happy. Those who know nothing say that to me. There's an evil out there. The air's no balm. Stop trying to soothe me. I won't be calmed. A gentle day. I won't be harmed. Banishment. From the house, barely, nakedly, burningly driven into pasture beyond. Bad daughter thrown across acres without even a mother's shawls and pillows. Where to sleep where hopping things won't hop and nest in her hair. Why throw out? Why not him too? All we did was kiss, a small shallow kiss. Now he drives by without a glance, years of driving by watering the field with his spit. And she, dressed in corn husks, arms pointed east, west, for all, even the crows, to scoff at her ragged, pathetic self. Inconsolable. Oh, my mother, I hear your dinner bell. I collapse at your door, hungry, alone, 
locked out and breathless from the relentless pressure of these parentheses. Scorned. So she will wear the field as a shawl. She will haul the sward's leavings to the river back and forth under sun and moon, the entire town dumping trash and curses upon her. Recurrent. I was aware of the cave's airiness, bats beating the currents hot, the tide pushed up against us, fish bombarded my knees and thighs, no shelf for me to lift up to, every kind of fish imaginable. You know my aversion to them, worse my terror, the shiny, wet, scaly, eye-popping mouth opened, leaping out of the water at me fish and the deepening brine absolutely teemed with them, their sharp teeth glaring. I counted every one with my eyes closed. I told myself they're only an inch long. They are oblivious to you. You will survive this, this episode. That's all it is. The others are not afraid. So why are you? They're even enjoying the swim. Think, why are you afraid? What sludgy hideousness happened to you to make you this afraid? Oh, it doesn't matter. Swim, grow up. But then frogs entered the pool and the water boiled thick with them. 50 exactly landed on my head all at once. You must remember, don't you? My aversion to them, their croaking, their green sliminess, their ability to jump, land, slide, and land again. So of course there were frogs in the up-to-my-neck-by-now pool. All other, wet, all other things wet dove in, an explosion of wetness. You also entered, trillions of you upon my shoulders, between my legs, spawning in my ears. How to bear this one more second knowing it was only the beginning of the pool's beginning and me in it. Seen through glass, the eyelash magnified, also sperm, swimming like all of us, I thought. I thought nowhere, hamsters on a wheel. Husband seed speeding away from me, I saw the barrenness of my future when at that time, even the word my, coupled with daughter, son, house, plate, headache, my, over and over again, was plunged scalpel sharp into the heart by well-intentioned friends, as in, my Ben turns 10 today, sending me to the inner skull's roof, a cliff to leap from. Yes, until I suppose after decades, I just became deafened to and by the word. And when I look at the world through the glass of the microscope on the loved one's curious desk to discover what the dampness of a paper towel reveals, the mind is flat as a jellyfish fried on Miami beach sand. I was once there with parents in the 60s, rich enough for the fountain blow, its Shirley temples and umbrellaed virgin, virgin drinks all for me and that wondrously glorious pool, empty at noon, save for father, who we all watched through the surprising glass wall at our first buffet there, along with other guests pointing, laughing, then ready to harpoon him as he oblivious, pulled off his trunks and performed that underwater dance. A few teams jumped in, saw, and raced away from the excited milky water. I'm imagining that detail. What brings me to the microscope today? Certainly not sperm. Peanut butter smeared, just peanut butter. Drop of diseased blood, white cells unreadable to me. A dead cat's whisker 
retrieved from safekeeping. Dull, perhaps. I never see anything more than what's evident. Joanna's eye. Four of us followed our faster friend who was already up our oak, her main coon climbing to higher than that hanging mosquito filled back we pointed to from below where jeweled weeds shot high, tickling and stinging our thighs. A bit to our left, there he was, naked and crouching in the shade at just about 10 o'clock, thinking himself unseen or knowing himself seen, his hand busy where it was, his tongue panting, as our worlds at once unsteadied, the cat hissed at the snap of a tender branch. Our friend fell onto her jackknife and her left eye lost forever became, we'd, begged her, we'd beg her to let us play with it, a green flecked marble. Unsoft. From the beginning, that was only my beginning, I don't presume it was anyone else's, I was different. No one came forward to nurse or clean me. Ashamed to look away, they could not look at, for I was, if not horned and befouled, repugnant, reminding them of the ever suppressed collective nightmare. Even in their most naked moments, Barely awake, before coffee and eggs, dawn just beginning to melt the crust at their eyes. They heard my squalls and pretended I was yet to arrive into their lives. I was still just a swelling for those few moments, a happy promise. From the beginning, I was demanding and insatiable. I ate through carpet, pearls, quilts, and pets. I demolished bank accounts and shat out snake heads. I was, I remember, a beast, unsoft, rancid, my milk teeth pointing in all directions. I was at home in their root cellar, hayloft, dung pile, pig slop bucket, called scarecrow, gaseous, fungal spread. I'm not self-loathing, mind you, and I do not ask to be convinced otherwise. My sister knew I belonged townships away at the lodge. Send it to the lodge, she'd pray through her sheets. But I'd made that impossible, having snuck through the portal to smear my waist on those walls and across the sleeping foreheads of its occupants. My signature. You see, I wanted to stay with my family, my loved ones. If only it wasn't so difficult to smother a difficulty I'd hear through my crib's sheets. I tried to make it easy for them, loving each enough to keep trying to help. I rose up again and again to meet the pillows held above my head. How sad. Their kisses were bitterly thin. Their love making so dry, blisters erupted. To lure her, he coated and dusted himself with sweetness of any form. But only bears, ants, and bees circled him. Bears, ants, gnats, bees, all the universe's creatures attached to his skin, save her. Embraced. I have visited an ancient redwood and heard it creak as I've rested my cheek and ear against its trunk. It has received my deepest sobs and my hundreds of fingerings along its soft bark. Leaning into it, 
I have whispered to my most darling ones, mother, Lucy, my multicolored cats, as if they've coursed through the tree's vascular system to form an inner pool, their happy noise so audible. I've stopped at the tree for hours over years in the shadow of Mount Tam, and I've napped at tree's base, inebriated by the moldy brew of its memories boiled up to commingle with the mist of my breathings of nose, mouth, and cells, so that I must slow, resist rushing past, to recall the paddings of creatures before me, as well as my own over years. I always like to pretend the tree has fashioned a thick, fresh bed of fallen needles, especially for me. Today, as I walk the loop around Bon Tempe Lake, I hear the loud and familiar hello from the tree. It's creek long, bent like, and old. I know the tree has ushered me back to remind me that this, that it has, in particular, missed me. The tree wants to know where I've been these past years, and where I wish to go, and where I think I will go. And I'll conclude with the last poem of The Thin Wall. Nothing, it, sorry. Nothing is the thin wall of glass as thin as skin just over there. I think if I look at that woman's shoes coated in hardened mud, and if I calculate the weight that this playground supports right now, all the dirt, dogs, benches, swing sets. And if I count from memory the freckles on my mother's arms and face, I might forget about the one who wakes me by screeching into my brain that nothing grabs us all, good or bad, boy, girl, popular, un, you. I also think that my ability to become misplaced to take a few steps away and find myself in someone's poppy garden or in the frozen aisle at the market or hovering at the, hovering at the ceiling of my sister's bedroom in Thomaston, looking down at her asleep, lost, upside down, turned around, unable to navigate, lost, so far might have, I believe, kept me from the thin glass wall just over there. I know exactly where it is. Thank you, thank you very, very much. Hi, I'm back in a new room on a new computer. So I guess I should finish the reading, right? Martha, that was a beautiful reading. Um, I'm not going to read the rest of that last poem because it's apparently bad luck. And um, and also, um, I heard somebody very kindly posted a link to it um, over at the Paris Review. So I'll just read a few, maybe one poem, two poems from one book and two from the other, and that'll be that. Um, This poem is called How He Loved Them. It's from the book, How He Loved Them. How much the Colonel loved his granddaughters, you will never know. Their laughter filled his black Mercedes the way a flock of starlings might fill a single tree with song. What he'd had to do that day, he'd done with a troubled heart but now their laughter overwhelmed him with such inarticulable love, he could hardly contain it. And neither could the empathetic little bomb in the engine, which chose that moment to burst through the hood with self-obliterating joy. And the Mercedes burned in front of the courthouse and the black smoke billowed and rose like a heart full of love. 
And the kernel rose too, like burning newspaper, caught in the wind, a scrap of soot, then nothing, then unknowable. You will never know what dying is like. The Colonel's granddaughters are still laughing in the back seat, or they are uncomfortable in the new bodies the bomb made for them. Oh, darling, darling, one of them recalled, you are burning up with fever. Her mother's cool hand on her forehead, then the sense of slipping under into black sleep. She's asleep now, the voice said, turning out the light and closing the door. And in every hand, smartphones made footage of their bodies, the heaps and twists of metal. The smoke uploaded the wreckage to the screen-like sky where it goes on burning forever. You will never know if dying is like that. The same scenes repeated across a larger mind than yours. Is it like a small girl with a high fever asleep in a dark room recollected for a moment as the brain closes down? She's asleep, the voices say. She's resting, my fleeting one, my obliterated device, my bit of pixelated soot. Hit pause and the smoke stops, a black pillar that weighs the wreckage down. Then hit play, how much he loved them, unknowable. What the Colonel had done that day had troubled his heart, but the sound of his granddaughter's laughter lifted him high into the air like a scrap of burning paper blown from the street into the trees. This is a much shorter one. Um, I was at a restaurant and I was eavesdropping on the couple at the table next to me. One was a man who had clearly just returned from the military somewhere. And the other was a woman who I, I just didn't like. Um, and she said that thing you never want somebody to say at a restaurant to the waiter. She said, just a glass of water for me, thank you. You know, and um, anyway, I just wrote this poem. Um, it's called Overheard in a Restaurant. Just a glass of water for me, thank you. One ice cube, thanks, just one. But please, you order what you want, don't be shy, and don't worry about me. I'm keeping trim for our troops. That ribeye looks promising though, doesn't it? The charcuterie platter, the bay shrimp in a nest of deconstructed kale drizzled with truffle oil. It's nice to have you home for a few days. Did you read about how they beheaded another captured soldier? Cut his head right off, clean as you like. I know, it's terrible. Awful, really. It ought to be a crime, but the water flushes me out and gives me a kind of inner peace. All this war must have been hard on you, the bodies and the IEDs and the threatening music. It certainly has been hard on our nation, and we weren't even there. Broccolini, yes, you should have that and the foie gras on toast with foraged mushrooms and lemon foam. You should try those too. And look at those cauliflower florets, like petite puffs of smoke. The raviolini afloat in broth like misfired paratroopers. Did you read how they sliced his head right off? You should eat. They'll send you back and you'll be nothing but bones. I'll just read two more and they're both, this is my first reading of all time from this new book that um, Four Ways Publishing um, in a few weeks. This is my advanced reader's copy, which I just, I want to lick it. Um, this poem is called In the Bad Days. Remember those? In the Bad Days. I am writing to you from deep in the bad days hoping you will hear me wherever you are, far away, in a better time. In a better time, hoping you will hear me far away, wherever you are. I came upon a heron late at night, deep in these bad days. 
Late tonight, deep in our bad days, he plucked a frog from the water-filled ditch. His eye was black glass. I am writing to you, wherever you are. Late in my bad days, the frog's neck was broken, so its legs dangled. The heron eyed me blackly from the wet ditch. I am writing to you from deep in the black days, the dead dangled. I watched from the sidewalk, the heron's glass eye eyed me in the streetlight's glare. Wherever you are, in a better time, people were dying. I'm writing to tell you people are dying. Remember that while you tie your shoes to go for your walk through the song filled night, through the beautiful night in another time. And this is the last one I'm going to read. Um, and I apologize again for the terrible internet. Um, I went, was going to see a translator give a lecture. Um, I, I won't say where, um, but he's a guy I really didn't like. I just don't like this guy. And um, he made this comment. He said somewhat pretentiously, a poem in translation is like the dead body of a foreigner washed up on our shores. That's what he said. And everybody kind of went, oh, because they thought it was profound. And I almost did, you know? And then I thought about it and I just thought, no, that's not profound. That's ridiculous. Like, that's a ridiculous thing to say. So I wrote this poem for him. It's called The Translator. A poem in translation, the young man was fond of saying, is like the dead body of a foreigner washed up on our shores. Here, he usually paused to let the metaphor sink in. Some members of the audience nodded thoughtfully. I will now read from my translations of a little known ancient Roman poet, he told them, shuffling his papers and looking into the dark, half empty auditorium. The dead body refused to be still. The waves loved it too much, pushing it onto the beach, then rolling it seaward again. And so it made its way down the beach, alighting for a moment or several moments. Swimmers. 120 foreigners in a leaking boat is too many. So the ocean fills with poems. Some retain the qualities of their original language, but others sink into a new language. Here I am out here. I can see your glittering oil, oil rigs on the horizon, says the young woman whom no one listens to. Or she says nothing, clinging to the side of the waterlogged boat where she has floated all night among the drifting bodies. A few of them became tangled among the oil rigs while others arrived gently on our shore. A poem that has floated some distance from its accident transforms. So the people ran away in horror when at last he came to rest on a crowded part of the beach. You foreigners in your many sailed ships, come join the empire, the translator intones from his spotlit podium. And the audience sighs. Here I am, out here, says a little voice inside the translation, a voice no one, not even the translator can hear. The audience had come to hear a lecture on poetry in translation, and now the translator was going on about the ancient Roman tendency to absorb and therefore transform foreign cultures, their gods and foods. Outside the auditorium, it had grown dark, a perfect summer night. The thousand vessels on the great black ocean glittered and loomed, and for days bodies washed up on the beach. Now the American workers zippered them into vinyl bags, which, in the translator's metaphor, constitutes a kind of publication. But what is there to say about the young woman still clinging to the wreckage two days into my poem? A gentle summer rain prickles her skin. Here I am, she says, looking toward the oil rigs hunkering between her and the shore. Here I am. She is a very fine woman and someone should translate her. Thank you.